All right, well, I've been given the assignment to look at DNA dragnets and race. And um, I want to treat this both as literal and metaphoric. The literal part is relatively straightforward. Uh, the, the Europeans pioneered the dragnet. Uh, it's in the paper. And so if I get to it, fine. But we're behind time, and so I, I may not get to the actual dragnet. Actually, I want to spend more time talking about what I'll call the metaphoric issue, the way in which the, in the last short period, the last five to 10 years, we've seen this encroachment, uh, the ex expansion of DNA databases, uh, as, as Harry mentioned, in this fashion which penetrates more and more into communities of color. So um, let me begin with uh, what is already out there. Indeed, it, it, this, this predates, it precedes the DNA. And that's the massive incar incarceration uh, of, of black people in the last uh, 30 years. If we go back to the 1920s, um, the ratio was about two to one, incarceration of, of black to white. If I, did, if I had those data, it would be about two to one. By the 30s, it was two and a half to one, four to one by the 50s, six to one by the 70s. And by the turn of the century, that ratio was eight to one. Now, fascinatingly, the ratio of arrests of black to white for marijuana and other kinds of issues is exactly the ratio of incarceration. This is the, exa this is the, this is the same issue, but now with a, in a graphic form. So you can see what starts off in the, if I went back to 1920, it would be two to one. And you can see how it climbed. I'd like to point out to my colleagues in behavioral genetics that this, um, could not be explained by genetics because gene pools among humans don't change in 75 years. What's happened here is a dramatic shift in the nature and character of criminal justice practices. Now, there will be some redundancy in my presentation, in part because uh, I didn't know that others were going to talk so much about cold hits. Um, but that's all right, because this te technology is somewhat complicated. And Bill later on is going to spend more time with the details of cold hit problems. I'm going to come at it from a point of view of a kind of a social political analyst, OK? So let's go to the expansion of state da data banks. You heard, you heard this morning how, in the very beginning, we only had sex offenders in DNA banks. And then we moved to more serious violent offenders, homicides. We then moved to uh, burglars, robbers. Then we moved to car thieves. And um, we expanded that database continually until we moved now in all of these states to looking at mere misdemeanors. And of course, the issue is what you heard this morning. We're now talking about 12 states collecting data on arrestees only. They're either authorized to do so or are doing so currently. So a massive expansion in the, the, the DNA databases. Just to give you a quick picture, uh, the Fingerprint Act of 2005, quarter million federal arrests per year, 1.3 million detained each year, suspected of immigration violations. Um, a lot of this is going into the CODIS national database. The bottom of the screen, which you can't see in the back of the room, it says that the federal government is providing incentives, economic incentives to states to include arrestees. And you know what happens when you have incentives, but your financial, the states which are out of sorts for, for money. So this is, a, this is an expanding program. This is a, a creeping and then uh, soon, I think, um, running process of the expansion of the databases to arrestees. Again, these figures are, one, one, are no surprise to any of you. Um, Jim Austin just put together this last year. So let me just point out what's going to be the source of my notion of the metaphoric DNA racial dragnet. 60% of the population of prisons is either African American or Latino. 20% of black males, 25 to 44, have already served at some point <coughs> in their life. 
and 8% of black males of working age are currently behind bars. That gives you a sense of the scale. Now, cold hit technology. Um, let's take this notion of an offender database. People who have committed a crime, convicted, their DNA is collected. The presumption was that people who have been in this situation have diminished expectation of privacy. And so you can collect their DNA and keep it and store it and do what you want to do with it. So that's the, 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 the idea that these are offenders. But you just heard from me and earlier this, this morning that this offender base is including people who are simply arrested. So the whole notion that we begin with, an offender base, starting with sex criminals, going to homicides, and so on, now includes arrestees. And the federal government is being uh, seductive to states to, to increase, increase. So now we have close to 6 million people in what is called the offender database. But watch out for that term. It doesn't mean what it used to mean. It just means people who've been collected into the dragnet of the, the, this database. So you heard, uh, again, this morning's primer, forensic sample. Well, that's something at the crime scene. Uh, they collect at uh, the crime scene, and they've got 180,000 of these stored away as of March of 2007. So here's the situation of a cold hit. Relatively straightforward. Got a huge database, 5 million, 6 million nationally. You have a, a crime scene tissue samples, 180,000. The cold hit is when you're trolling this big database with this one. And you find, bingo, a sufficient match at the correct number of alleles to say we have a suspect in a crime. There have been more than 59,000 cold hits out of this database in the last few, few years. And now what I'll call the surge. States maintain their own databases and then link to the federal system. And here's the sense of how fast this is happening. In this short eight-year period, Virginia had only 1,000 cold hits. But the next 1,000 came in the next 18 months. This is an expansion of remarkable proportions happening, again, as we speak. Now, the UK, a typical month, produces 50 cold hits for homicide, 30 for rape. But I'm sure you'll hear from, uh, again, Helen this afternoon, uh, more on this topic. Most of these cold hits are not about these violent crimes. They're about motor vehicle, property, and back to Harry this morning, drug offenses. In the US in 2003, 10 and a half million burglaries, grand thefts, auto thefts. We're clearing only about 13% of them uh, the burglaries by arrest. So there's a kind of seduction on the part of the police departments to find ways of getting these kinds of low figures up to 20, 30 percent. What, what, what a better way than to just go through to a, a machine and click the number of potential alleles and hope, hope, you, hope you can get your cold hits. California, the largest genetic profile uh, by far in the country, nearly a million, working through a backlog of 13,000 old cases, now averages a, one cold hit per day. So, th so this is the, the state database. They've got 13,000 cases, run up against this, one a day. Now, one of them was a man named John Davis in the penitentiary in California for robbery. And they had an unsolved murder. Now, they had his DNA in the database. And so they ran it against the offender base, the forensic versus the offender. And bingo, they get John Davis, they think. The cold hit for Davis matched the 13 segments, or loci, as you heard this morning, thought to be definitive. His defense attorney, uh, Bicker Barlow, I've been reading about a case, uh, Bika is a, uh, by training also, she's done some work in 
much with genetics. She had a, a master's degree in that, in that field, and so she knew a little, about, a little about the problems. So she, she heard about a case in Arizona that people had been matched, two people had been matched at nine loci. She appeared, subpoenaed the Arizona data, and she got the material. 65,000 offenders in that database, 122 pairs matched at nine loci. Whoa. Stunningly, 20 pairs matched at 10 loci, and one pair each matched at 11 and 12. That's never supposed to happen, or at least one in a billion. The language is always in these extraordinary terms, especially in a legal case. You say, well, the chance of a, a nine loci match um, by randomly, and a, maybe one in a billion. She sees 122 among less than 70,000. So she posts her findings on her website to alert others in the country, especially defense attorneys. And she subpoenas California's Department of Justice to compel the state lab to analyze its own data as she had, as had been done with Arizona. Now, you'll never imagine what happened unless you read my paper. <laughs> the FBI, in, uh, War and Peace, Truth and Justice, sends out a nationwide alert saying, tell us if you get any such requests for multiple matches. The Attorney General of Arizona faxed her a letter from CODIS that had been faxed to him, saying, um, take down the Barlow posting, or we'll bar Arizona from the CODIS national database uses. Next, she goes to the California Attorney General's office to, and finds that they've blocked her attempts to force a review, calling it, quote, a fishing expedition. California judiciary then denies her the attempt to probe the database. Arizona bars her from circulating her report on the state's number of dual matches. And she says with tongue in cheek, she's the only person in the country who can't put up any figures on the topic. Now, finally, the case before the California Supreme Court, more than 50 scientists, including Jeffries, one of the founders of DNA fingerprinting has signed the, has signed the amicus brief saying, um, let's support access to the California database. Let's see just how many matches we're going to get at 9, 10, and 11 loci. Now, this is the context uh, in which I made my remarks this morning about forensic science. You know, it's not what you think. <laughs> Um, first of all, it's, there's no peer review. It's proprietary. The government often gives it to some particular lab. That lab has an interest in its own kinds of technologies. It's not going to share them. And there's no possibility, except with a defense attorney who has a lot of resources, to get into, the, into anything resembling verification. And so, therefore, we have a series in the last short period of lots of scandals around um, whether it's Houston or Virginia. Um, lots of people are now raising questions about these kinds of Boston. Boston well, you name it. Actually, um, last night we heard from Peter Neufeld. He's he supposed to be here today, but he's now in Mississippi because he's down there with an exoneration case. Uh, I think it's number 17, he told me. Two cases? OK. Uh, number 16 and 17. And once again, it's a Mississippi situation where, where the crime lab has been implicated in certain kinds of activity, um, proprietary forensic science. OK. Now, I, this is the point I really want to emphasize. Um, most, most of us in this room understand the plea bargain as the dominant experience of criminal justice. There's no surprise here. And in the paper, 